Well, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our, our text is uh, part of the high priestly prayer, and so I'd just like to give you an outline of chapter 17 of John this morning. And that basically talks about how Jesus has put, put this petition together. He prays for himself, he prays for his disciples, and he prays for all believers. That would be you and me. Okay, so this is how Jesus constructed this prayer. It's called the high priestly prayer because he is the high priest who intercedes for all humanity. And he's also the sacrifice at the same time. So let's talk, first of all, a little bit about Jesus' praise for himself this morning. Jesus requests to be glorified in glorifying the Father. Jesus speaks of the past and the future from an eternal perspective. That's all ground in the present tense. Jesus is talking about the climax of history, that he will face the cross, that he will go to the cross, that he will be crucified, died, and buried and three days be raised again. So in front of Jesus is the mission of his Father, the theme of glory, to bring God the Father all glory by going to the cross and dying for our sins upon that cross. Jesus manifested the Father's love by his gracious life, in reaching out to the lost, the lonely, the hurting, and the downcast. So you've probably never been lost or hurting or lonely in your life, right? Never been downcast? Okay. I mean, that's part of life. It's like hills and valleys. And sometimes we're on top of the hill. Life is great. Don't really need God. Sometimes we're in the valley. Hey, God, we really need you at this point in time. That's kind of human nature for each and every one of us. We recognize that there is a God of love who reaches down and he knows our hurts, he knows our pains, because he became one of us. He understands people making fun of people. He understands what the world has to offer. In death, Jesus manifests the love of the Father to all creation. So the Father is the ultimate source of love, and the Son is the dispenser of all God's love as he dies on the cross to glorify the Father and help us to understand that by grace we are saved as a gift of faith. Eternal life is knowing the Father and Jesus whom the Father has sent. Okay. So if you know the Father, you know the Son. Okay, Because Philip asks, well, show us the Father. And Jesus says, you've seen him because you've seen me. So if you know the Father, you know the Son, then you reflect the Son and the Father by how you live. Being gracious and kind and full of mercy. Helping people when they're downcast, lost, and downtrodden. You walk with them as Christ has walked with each and every one of us. You see why bad things happen to good people? Because there are no good people, first of all. Jesus said there's no one good but God. But when bad things happen to us, you ask, why is this happening to me? I mean, that's common. Well, the reason it's happening for, to you is so that God can get your attention. And secondly, that you can help somebody else who's going through a very similar situation. You see, when bad things, what we call bad, happen to us, we're being equipped, we're being pruned, if you will, and nobody likes to be pruned, but that makes us better people. Now, we're trying to grow some crepe myrtles in our backyard, and they want to be bushes, but we want them to be trees. So that means that we have to prune them about two or three times in the summer as you just rip off the suckers off the bush. Okay? Now, does the bush like that? Heck no. They don't like that at all. But when God prunes us, we don't like it either, but it's for our growth, our spiritual growth. Is God sometimes has to get our attention so that we can love one another as we have been called and challenged to do. So the cross was before Jesus, before the world began from God's perspective because he doesn't live in time. But the cross is the focus of Christ's life. And as that was the focus of Christ's life, that should be the focus of our life as well. That on the cross, 
I am saved, that on the cross I am redeemed, that on the cross God's mercy and God's glory are shown to me, a poor, miserable sinner. Well, Jesus glorifies the Father by the cross, and Jesus prays for his disciples. The first thing that Jesus prays for is their eternal security. Well, Jesus has given his disciples a foundation of faith. He's taught them for three and a half years. You know, sometimes the disciples get it, and sometimes they don't get it. Now, you've probably never been like a disciple, right? You always get it, right? Okay, the one thing I tell my wife, don't give me hints, just tell me straight up, because I don't get it at times as a guy. Happy Mother's Day, right? <laughs> the disciples belong to Jesus because the Father has given his disciples to him. We belong to Jesus because we have been given by the Father, entrusted to the Son, and the Holy Spirit has created faith in our hearts, and that's the gift of God's grace. We understand God's glory. We understand who God is through the Son and the power of the cross. Jesus prays that the disciples will have his joy. So what is Jesus' joy? Let me show you from Hebrews chapter 12. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. That's kind of like that maze in life, okay? Is that sometimes you come to a dead end, you got to back up and go around. Sometimes you just got to ask for directions. Sometimes you just need help. But we fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning his shame. So what, what brought Jesus joy was to go to the cross. Now, you can say, how can this be? How can there be joy in going to the cross? Because it was the Father's will. Fulfilling the Father's will brings joy to the Son. How many times have you, as a little child, when you fulfilled the will of your parent, Hey, I really feel good about myself. Remember those days when you were a small child? That you fulfilled the will of your mother or father. Well, Jesus has this same process. Fulfilling the will of the Father brings glory to him, and God glorifies the Son. When we talk about having our eyes and our focus, once again, it's on the cross because this is not our home. Hebrews 12.3 says, Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You know, God bless the children of our world today because this world is an evil world. You see it all around you. And if your child is in school, you recognize that there are evil children around them because they're saints, right? Never do anything wrong. We live in a world of fallen sinners, no matter what age we are. It's really difficult to be a young person in school because of all of the things around them that people make fun of them if they aren't like them, if they're not doing exactly what they're asked to do. As adults, people make fun of us just as well because we aren't like them. Now, I'm, I'm not... Republican or Democrat in this, but Mike Pence, vice president, people are making fun of him of his Christian faith. That's in the news. Okay, I consider him a good man. I consider him a strong believer. But people outside of faith are making fun of him because of his faith. Well, that's what Jesus is talking about. It's a thing of perseverance. You have to recognize if you are different than the world and the world system, the world's system will make fun of you and degrade you and do everything it can to make you fit into the world's system. That's the world that you and I live in today. But we don't have to live in the world because we are not of the world. I, let me say that. We don't have to be of the world even though we are in the world. Allison shared a few weeks ago the acronym for joy, Jesus, others, and you, and that's the way we ought to love people. But our world today is all about me. It's about humanism or secular humanism. It's what is right for me. You have no right to tell me what's good for me. I can make my own choices. Now, 
you recognize if you've got a small child and you want to help them to get across the street, they say, no, I don't want to go. And they, you know, they're, they're tugging and they want to go their own way. That's humanity because we think we're smarter than our parents when we're really small. And as adults, we think we're smarter than God at times because it's all about you and it's all about me. Jesus prays for the disciples against the tax of Satan, that, and he prays through the name above all names. This is the only place in Scripture where you see Holy Father, the only place. Holy is our God. Holy is the one who died for us because of his righteousness and what he has done for each and every one of us. And Jesus prays for the oneness of, of the disciples. Now let me illustrate it like this. Husband and wife, if you're not on one and the same page, life is tough because it's like this, not like this. You begin to understand that? And so if you're not even in the same book, it's like this, not like this. So oneness of the Father and the Son is like this. And Jesus prays for this oneness for his disciples. But I, I pray, and you pray, for the oneness of his church, Christ the King. Because if we are not in oneness, we are like this. We are pounding on each other because we see the shortcomings in each other. So you have your focus. Focus on the shortcomings or focus on the benefits of being one body of believers in Christ. Oneness is lifting one another up. The opposite of oneness is putting each other down. So you get your choices in life. And Jesus prays for the oneness that includes the death of self for the sake of the gospel. So maybe another way to talk about oneness and illustrate this for all you moms, okay, you gave up your womanly shape to be pregnant, to have a child. You gave up a lot, a lot more than a husband, I'll tell you that right now. You gave up your body being stretched and all the stretch marks you got to have and everything else to bring life into the world. And you and the child were one at a time before birth. Jesus is calling us to have that same concept of oneness. Oneness in purpose. And the purpose is the focus of the cross of Jesus Christ, where the sins of the world are taken away, where the glory of God is seen in the life of Jesus, and where we see that we are called to take up our cross and follow Jesus. And taking up the cross means that you are different, that people are going to ridicule and make fun of you and bring it on. That's what I say, bring it on. Because I'm going to follow Jesus. My oneness, my focus is the cross of Christ and my salvation because I am not of this world. This is not my home. Heaven is our home. Our focus is beyond the pleasures of what the world has to offer to what Christ has given us. So Jesus prays for the sanctification of his disciples, and he consecrates their service to the cross. Hebrews 12 says, Make every effort to live in peace with everybody and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Now, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. What does that mean? Holiness means lifestyle. It means I am different than the parameters of what this world says I can be. I believe in marriage, one man, one woman. I believe that I love my neighbor as I love myself. I believe in the great... Uh, I, I believe in the golden rule is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I believe 
is that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior, and my life is here to give him all honor and glory. So it's not about what the world has to offer. It's about what the cross has to offer. And it offers me everything because I have eternal security in Christ. So unity is the sacrificial love of Christ lived out by his disciples. And so as a church, we have to be unified. As husband and wife, we have to be unified. As family, unification makes us much stronger than separation. So when we begin to talk about Jesus prays for all believers and unity, I'd like to use this as an illustration this morning. Ordinary glass of water that I got pulled out of the tap here at Christ the King. Would I drink it? Yes. Would you drink it? Well, obviously I'd get you a new glass, right? Another glass of water I got out, but I put dirt in it. Would you drink this one? No, okay. So, let me illustrate something. The righteousness of Christ, the righteousness of mankind. You see, what we try to do is sell everybody how good I am, and this is what they see in each and every one of us. Hypocrite. Hypocrisy. This is the world that we live in today. People say, I'm really good, when really, we're all hypocrites. This is how God would have us live, to love God with all we have, to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, to show God's holiness in our lifestyle. So when we begin to look at these two concepts this morning, How do we glorify God, by our own self-righteousness or by the righteousness of Christ? So God is calling us to be like his son. So the disciples are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So I'm going to ask you to get a pen or pencil out, piece of paper, and write down one Bible verse today and take it home with you today. It's 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. So 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. Those two verses, this is the way of the world in very succinct language. I'll read it to you. St. John writes, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love of, for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, and here's the way of the world, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. You see, we live in a world called humanism. It's all about we as the center of everything. I mean, we can stop anything out there because we're gods unto ourselves. Humanism says that I promote what Satan enjoys. I promote lust of the flesh, and believe me, there's plenty of lust in the flesh to go around in our world today. I would never have dreamed in my whole lifetime that we would actually have sex slaves in our country, that we would actually use people as pieces of flesh for our own enjoyment. I would never, ever have believed that. The lust of the eyes... Eve saw that the fruit was good, and so she ate of it. And then the pride of life. So how do advertisers work? Pretty much this way. You need this. This will make you a better person. It's the I see it first and say, I need this because I can self-help myself. I can help myself to be successful. I can do anything in this world if I just have enough of the tools and the determination to make me successful. So I need the latest and the greatest. So iPhone 10, okay? It's better than iPhone 8. It's better than iPhone 7 and 6 and 5. So how many people own iPhone 10? You don't have to raise your hand. But I'm just telling you is that iPhone 10, 
outsold everything that they even imagined because their sales were so high because iPhone 10 does more than iPhone 8 and that makes me a better person because I have this wonderful instrument that makes me feel better about myself and it helps me to communicate with all of my friends now I own an iPhone so I'm not putting it down I don't own a 10 and I'm and I'm not jealous <laughs> but sometimes we get our identity from things in the world if you drive a Beamer, it's better than a Ford. You drive a Cadillac, it's better than a Chevy. I mean, you, you begin to understand is that if I live in this part of the city versus this part of the city, look at me. Look at my wealth. Look at how successful I are, am. And I can look down then on other people. But God calls us to lift other people up. Now, we have a good friend who is in construction and he's from Mexico. And he told me this story yesterday about his friends and what they're doing to help their family back in Mexico. Now, our friend and his, and his brothers, they send money to his parents every month to help them get along. Because the average person in Mexico that he knows makes $30 a week. I, we can't live on $30 a week. but. What his friends do is that they make tamales uh, once a week. They, they make them by the hundreds, and they sell them 12, a dozen for $12. And whatever money they amass in a month, they go down and they give it to their relatives because they recognize that their relatives are having a struggle on the other side of the border. So they usually raise three to $5,000 a month because there's about 20 to 30 of them that are doing this. So just think about this. If 20 to 30 of us got together, could we help a few people in our city that are less fortunate than we are? You know, Deborah and I bought an RV, driving kind, and people said, well, you deserve this. No, we don't deserve this. We're fortunate to have it, but we don't deserve it. How can we use our lives to help others? See, be of service to one another. Loving the world means being devoted to the treasures of this world. Loving God means focus on the cross and the cross only. We have become citizens of another kingdom. This is not our home. Would you say that with me? This is not our home. Let's say that once again. This is not our home. And we end with, heaven is our home. Would you say that with me? Heaven is our home. And all God's children say, amen.